I'm Phil Fleckman. I'm one of the dermatologists uh, work at the at the U at Roosevelt and at the VA. So let's talk. We're going to talk about anatomy, and I'll mention a few of the tumors and then a few concerns. And this is what I tell the residents: you should not hesitate to biopsy the nail unit. The nail unit behaves in unusual ways, and uh, if there's no correlation between what you see clinically and what you see or hear histologically, then you repeat the biopsy. So let's talk about anatomy. Okay, so this is the nail unit. It makes the nail plate. It consists of the nail folds, the matrix, uh, which extends under the proximal nail fold, the nail bed, uh, and the hyponychium, which seals the free edge of the nail plate. This is a blow up of that cartoon. So this is the proximal nail fold. Uh, the, nail, the matrix which makes the nail plate extends primarily under the proximal nail fold. The nail bed starts where the, mat where the matrix stops, and then where the nail bed stops and the nail lifts off is called the hyponychium. This is a sagittal section of a newborn nail. It shows what that looks like. This is an artifactual tear, but this is proximal nail fold. You can see the undersurface of the proximal nail fold. This is nail matrix. This is where the nail bed starts. This is all nail bed. And where the granular layer begins again is the hyponychium. And this is the, what's called the distal groove. And this is the nail plate. So the nail plate is this flat rectangular thing that extends under the proximal nail fold, five to eight millimeters, uh, and extends out over the free edge of the nail, uh, over the digit. The nail folds are the lateral nail folds on the proximal nail fold. The cuticle uh, is part of the nail fold, but it's really a thing unto itself. So the cuticle is the stratum corneum of the proximal nail fold as it grows out on the nail plate. And the cuticle extends really in the undersurface of the nail, of the proximal nail fold. This is called the epinychium. Uh, and it's what seals this proximal nail fold down on the nail plate. This is matrix here, and you can see where matrix thins out, the nail bed begins. The matrix is uh, this area that makes the nail plate. When it extends out over the free edge of the nail, it forms what's called a lunula. Uh, it is a proliferative unit. This is where the granular layer stops. That's where the matrix begins. This is apical matrix. So you can see a little part of the apical matrix begin, uh, begins before this bend. This is matrix here, and then where it thins out, it's nail bed. And you can see that a little bit more easily in this close-up. So you see the epinychium, which has a granular layer and forms a stratum corneum, which is the cuticle that seals this nail fold onto the nail plate. This is the matrix here. Uh, this outlines it a little bit differently. You, see, can, you can see granular layer, and this is a hard keratin stain for the beginning of formation of the nail plate. Uh, the epinychium, as I said, is the ventral surface of the proximal nail fold. It stops where the granular layer stops, uh, and uh, the matrix begins. Definition of the nail bed is where uh, the uh, matrix stops. It's a very thin epithelium. It's only two or three layers thick. Uh, you can see it thin out here. And if you look down at it, this would be white. This would be lunula. This would be pink, that would be nail bed. And the reason it's pink is because it's so thin and you see the vessels underneath. So this is a transverse section of a nail bed. And you can see it undulates, but it forms these rather regular undulations uh, so that if you evolve a nail plate, so this is a nail plate, you're ripping off nail bed, and you can see those nail bed extensions from beneath the nail plate. This is what a nail plate looks like if you do a scanning EM of an evolved nail plate, and I believe this is epithelium here. You can see these regular ridges. The regular ridges somehow allow the nail plate to grow out. Uh, 
so that uh, if you elevate the nail plate, you see these kind of tongue and groove extensions. Uh, and the reason uh, you see splinter hemorrhages is if, if you uh, lice a vessel, the blood leaks through and kind of winds these tongue and groove ridges. The hyponychium uh, is where the nail bed stops. Uh, it is an area uh, at the free edge of the, of the digit. It's where the granular layer begins and stratum corneum begins. And this is what's called the distal groove. If you look at your thumb from the edge, you can see the distal groove easily. So several keratins are expressed in the nail unit, both the normal uh, interfollicular epithelial keratins uh, and then a number of hard keratins, uh, and also so so-called proliferative keratins, keratin 16, 6, and 17. Let's talk about diseases now. This is lichen planus of the nail unit. Lichen planus is a can be a, a destructive process for the nail unit. Usually, you see uh, longitudinal ridges uh, and often just severe nail dystrophy. So if you biopsy, this is what we do. So basically we take a section, usually from a small finger that's less important. This is what that finger looks like after it's healed. Uh, the reason we do that is that lichen planus can look like onychomycosis, fungal infection. It can look like psoriasis and you might not be able to distinguish, to distinguish them. And when you have this much involvement, we treat with systemic meds. This is what's called a lateral longitudinal biopsy. And what we do is we cut through the nail plate into the proximal nail fold and then through the fibro fatty tissue of the side of the finger. So you're cutting down to the periosteum. This is cutting through the nail plate. Uh, and then you extend that uh, through this fibro fatty tissue like so. This is what that looks like when you extend that. And then we actually just, just lift this up. We'll talk about orientation of this at the end. But you can see that this is a really small area. The anatomy is fairly complex. So orienting these specimens is critical. So that's the lateral longitudinal biopsy. We then bring the nail fold over and stitch it up. But this is what that looks like uh, as it heals. This is actually histology of lichen planus of the nail unit. And the reason we biopsy and we want to treat lichen planus is that lichen planus can be a destructive disease. So this is the thing that I worry about. This is called the pterygium, which is named after the Greek for bat wing or wing. And what happens is the proximal nail fold seals to the nail bed. So you have these kind of little nails hanging out. And you can have total loss of nails with lichen planus. Acquired digital fibrokeratomas are probably the most common tumors you guys will see. Um, you can see this area of distal onycholysis. And if you, look at the, if you look at this nail plate end on, you'll see this little tuft of tissue hanging out. These are all digital fibrokeratomas. So this is one that is a classic. Uh, they can be from the proximal nail fold. They can be quite large and can, what can grow out of uh, proportion to the nail unit. Digital fibrokeratomas can arise anywhere in the nail unit. So they can arise on the side of the, of the digit. They can arise from the proximal nail fold. They can arise from an area and attach to the periosteum or more commonly from the nail bed or the hyponychium. I used to blow off the digital, digital fibrokeratomas because most of them are benign. However, you can be fooled. So we've seen people with bone disease, with basal cells. I worry about amelanotic melanoma and other tumors. So we now biopsy them and there are several ways we do that. These are all subungual acquired digital fibrokeratomas. They've been renamed you know, by the kind of common name, onychopapilloma. The onychopapilloma is the benign variant of this. So you can see just longitudinal erythronychia, a red band uh, with splinter hemorrhages. You can see something actually growing very large under the nail, under the nail plate. 
like this. Usually, if we want to see these, we do avulsions. This is what's called a trapdoor avulsion, where you maintain the attachment of the cuticle to the nail plate, lift the nail plate up, but leave it unattached below here, but attached to the proximal nail fold. Uh, this is one of those that we showed earlier, and there are several ways we get those out. Sometimes we can just blunt dissect them out and then cure at the base, and that's what we did with this. Sometimes uh, we have to excise them. So we will see uh, eroded areas. This is the avulsed nail plate, the trap door avulsion. We see eroded areas, and we'll do uh, a, uh, uh, an oval excision, and sometimes the tissue sticks to the surface of the nail plate. A nicometricoma uh, is a neat tumor, and it's a tumor of the nail of the matrix. And often what we see are these areas of kind of yellow longitudinal banding. If you look at the free edge of the nail plate, it's thickened. Uh, and in fact, sometimes we will send a clipping from the free edge of the nail plate because what you see is this kind of mesh-like network. Uh, and it actually sends these kind of interdigitating fronds of tissue into the nail plate. So the nail plate is thickened and it has this kind of honeycomb tissue. Glomus tumors are interesting tumors. They're tumors of the neuromuscular or saccate Hoyer canal. They're in the neuromuscular cell. Uh, they can look like lots of things. Uh, this is a classic glomus tumor when you see this kind of violaceous macule beneath the nail plate. Glomus tumors are characteristic clinically because they hurt. So people will show, show up with short pains uh, there's point tenderness. Uh, the pain usually is worse in the cold. Uh, and if you release, if you, do, if you impair blood flow, uh, the pain usually goes away. Sometimes you'll see them, people who just have bad pain and have nothing you can see. There are several ways that, that we can visualize these tumors when we suspect that. Uh, and this is what we do for glomus tumors. We make incisions in the proximal nail fold and reflect it and expose the tumor, and then we will biopsy it. So usually this is just a punch biopsy, and then we will cure out uh, the area. Uh, the larger glomus tumors we send to the hand surgeons. Uh, this is what this nail fold looks like when it's sutured and the glomus tumor. Uh, warts can look like lots of things. Characteristically, uh, you see involvement of the uh, nail folds of the periungual tissue. So it's very uncommon to have a wart where you do not have involvement of the interfollicular epithelium. But usually when they extend on the nail plate, they can be very difficult to treat. I usually treat them by injecting bleomycin and the reason we do it is it works much better than all of the other destructive therapies. I suspect that's because the virus extends under the nail plate and you just can't get to it with the other destructive therapies. The problem is if you have a wart that doesn't respond to therapy, uh, you can be fooled. Uh, so warts can look exactly like squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so we biopsy them. And the thing about biopsying is that when you biopsy in the nail unit, we have to biopsy down to, to periosteum. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is very little tissue uh, between the nail and the bone. Uh, and if we can't see the dermal epidermal junction, you can't distinguish a wart from a squamous cell carcinoma. We see things that are bone disease. We see fibrokeratomas. Uh, we see sometimes glomus tumors. Um, all these biopsies uh, have to go to periosteum. This uh, typical ward actually turned out to be, uh, was unresponsive to therapy, turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. You have to see the DEJ in order to see these atypical keratinocytes. Squamous cell carcinoma of the nail unit usually is not subtle. Often you will have uh, destruction of bone associated with it. Usually you see uh, loss of nail plate. Uh, so 
going back to the fibroperitomas uh, and the warts, if it gets beyond that and goes to this, uh, then you're in serious trouble. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the nail unit is uncommon. Uh, most of them are associated with high-risk HPVs, uh, and we treat them usually with most surgery after we've made the diagnosis. Longitudinal melanomichia can be a number of things. Longitudinal melanomichia just means you have a longitudinal band of pigment in the nail unit. They can be quite subtle or fairly stark. The differential of longitudinal melanomichia is fairly extensive, but the things we worry about primarily uh, are the melanocytic processes. These are all these are all examples of longitudinal melanomichia that uh, are not malignant. Actually, this was someone who had a pigmented uh, T. rubrum uh, that ended up getting explored and biopsy because it was unclear what was going on. You can see it with pigmented uh, uh, fungal infections. Fungal hemorrhage is a very common thing that we see. It's easy to do, to see that dermatoscopically. Often when you have uh, persistent onycholysis, uh, this wet cave collects uh, pseudomonas. Pseudomonas makes pyocyanin, and you can see melanonechia. Chemotherapy uh, classically gives you this banded pattern. You can see uh, that arc-like pattern tells you that the pigment is endogenous, so it's being made by the matrix. It's not exogenous, not something that's been applied to the nail plate. You can also see it with AZT and a number of other drugs. This is a nail plate avulsion, which we often will do if we're biopsying the nail unit. We, if you will, rip the nail plate off the nail unit. When you take a nail plate off, you're taking epithelium off. And the reason I'm talking about this is that when we go to biopsy these areas, we're taking epithelium, and so my concern is that if you have melanocytes on the undersurface of the nail plate, uh, you will lose them if you don't if you don't submit the nail plate. This is what a finger with an evolved nail looks like. The normal nail plate grows out. Uh, it takes several months for that nail plate to grow out. This is from a total evulsion. Okay, longitudinal melanonychia uh, can be several things. Uh, commonly, about 70% of the time when we biopsy these, uh, we don't see anything. Uh, and it often, uh, it, it strikes me that when uh, we review the path of these biopsies, when I know that there's pigment in the nail plate, I'm really interested in what's making the pigment. So in melanotic macules, they're the equivalent of a freckle you don't see an increase in melanocytes in the nail unit. All you see is increased pigment in the nail. Melanocytic nevus uh, are very, they're very uncommon. This is an example of a melanocytic nevus uh, in uh, a fairly young Caucasian. Uh, they're usually asymptomatic. I worry about nail unit melanocytic nevi, and I have colleagues that say you don't worry about them. When you see longitudinal melanonychia, about 70% will be melanotic macules. Uh, another 20% will be uh, melanocytic nevus uh, or just activated melanocytes, where you see a few extra melanocytes, but not really a melanocytic nevus. And about 10% will be melanoma. Well, this is something that uh, we deal with, which uh, is very difficult, and that is activated melanocytic uh, uh, activity. This was an area of uh, longitudinal melanonychia in a 13-year-old girl. When we see children, and we worry about them, but we usually see nothing. So when we see longitudinal melanonychia, we, we look at them. We look at them dermatoscopically. We look for changes in uh, the nails, the nail folds, Hutchinson sign. We look for irregularity uh, by dermoscopy. Uh, you can't distinguish benign from malignant, but the odds are in a young person, uh, this is gonna be benign. 
The problem that I have is what do you do when you have someone who's reaching puberty? So this was a young lady who had this band of long, this area of longitudinal one in Nikia. It was biopsy. Uh, the biopsy was read. Uh, it was sent out for review. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the reviewing pathologist was very cautious in his interpretation and said, you basically can't exclude uh, melanoma in situ. The other problem we have is that if we send this, uh, if we send this to a hand surgeon, uh, the risk is they're going to not only excise the nail unit, they're going to do a partial amputation. So this 13-year-old girl has a partial amputation of her distal phalanx, of her do non-dominant thumb. The melanocytes in these things are very active. So she showed up with melanotic macules in the excision site. I think three times, and we biopsied them twice, uh, and they were benign. Reading activated melanocytic nevi in young people is extraordinarily difficult, and distinguishing them from melanoma is almost impossible. So this was read as melanoma in situ in, in the U.S. Uh, we actually sent the, the glass to uh, a, uh, a, a dermatopathologist in Brussels uh, who has dealt with mo many of these in young people uh, who said this is just an activated melanocytic nevus. So this young lady had her, her thumb partially amputated, really probably for no reason. When we see longitudinal melanonychia, if we have a, a band that we can cut out, we will do a longitudinal biopsy. Basically, we will do a sagittal section of this area to get all the pigment out. There's two reasons we do that. One is that you get the whole lesion out and you don't have to worry about it so much. The other is that you can see the whole thing. We make incisions on either side of the band. We extend those to the proximal nail fold and the hyponychium, and then we basically remove and block this macrosagittal suction. So this is what that looks like. You can make these incisions over the band of uh, longitudinal band. They're extended into the proximal nail fold and to the hyponychium. And then this tissue is removed in block, like so. Uh, this area is brought together. Uh, and this is what it looks like. That's one week afterwards. This is what a longitudinal biopsy should look like, OK? You may have a little bit of scar, but you should have an intact nail plate. When we have a broad uh, band of melanonychia, you can't really excise this band uh, and get a nail plate that sticks together. You'll have a split nail. And so what we do is called the tangential biopsy, which is essentially a shade biopsy of the matrix. For some reason, we're able to get, a lot, get away with this and get a fair amount of tissue uh, and still maintain an intact nail plate. Uh, we evolve the nail plate. Uh, and now what we're doing is a partial avulsion because this part of the nail plate really doesn't have information. We reflect the proximal nail fold. Uh, we outline the area of interest uh, and then cut around it and under it uh, and then reattach this. And this is what this nail looks like, this finger looks like uh, after the procedure, the nail plate has not grown out yet. This tissue gets oriented, and this is what you get. This is a really small piece of tissue. So we try to orient it as accurately as we can. This is what a finger should look like with the tangential biopsy. The issue with tangential or shaved biopsies in the matrix is that often the pigment returns. So you're stuck looking at this pigment. and you don't really know, you basically have to assume that it's okay. When I have people who have pigment that returns and it extends and it is concerning, I then send them to have the nail unit excised. Uh, I will not re-biopsy that area because the histology is hard enough to start with. And if you're trying to interpret histology uh, in, a, in, a, in a melanocytic process that's already been biopsied in an atypical site, I think it's really putting the pathologist in an unfair disadvantage. Uh, the other problem with tangential biopsies is that you can get nail dystrophy. 
Uh, acral intendinous melanoma is actually equally common in white and non-white populations. It's just that melanoma in people of color is, although it's infrequent, it's less common than in Caucasians, it's more commonly acral. Many of the, of the melanomas uh, in Japanese or in other people of color uh, are acral. Uh, often they're on the, the palm or the sole, uh, and they frequently involve the nail unit. Uh, the prognosis is generally poor, uh, and it's unclear, and why this is is unclear. It, it could be because uh, their people are reluctant to biopsy them. Uh, it could be that the path is difficult to interpret. It also could be that uh, people are just, uh, it has a biologic disadvantage. Uh, well, not benign melanocytic nevi and uh, melanotic macules are also very common in people of color. So a large percentage of the Japanese population have melanocytic nevi acrally. It's said that uh, over half uh, of African Americans over the age of 50 will have bands of color in their nail. So we're stuck with trying to determine whether these bands of color are benign or malignant. Some of melanoma occurs uh, more commonly in the large digits. Uh, in Caucasians, you see usually a single longitudinal band. Uh, as I said, in people of color, subungual melanoma is uncommon, but it occurs, and, when it, uh, and melanoma, when it occurs, is more common acrally. Biology is disputed. Often the diagnosis is delayed because people are just reluctant to, to biopsy. Uh, these are acral intigenous melanomas. Uh, several things here make you concerned. So when we see people who have bands of pigment in their nail, we look for certain changes. Destruction of the nail plate is one. Uh, pigment in the hyponychium, uh, the pulp, or the proximal nail fold, uh, so-called Hutchinson sign, is another uh, serious uh, uh, sign. The other thing that we worry about are the so-called triangle sign. So if you see a lesion that's expanding rapidly enough to be wider at the base than at the apex, you know that this is growing fast. It takes about six months for a nail plate to grow out in a, in a hand. So this is expanding rapidly. So all these signs are signs that are concerning. Often when we see something like this, so if I see someone who has a nail like this and has Hutchinson sign, we'll basically take the nail plate off, look in the area of most interest, do a punch biopsy, send you the tissue because we're not going to be treating this melanoma. If we see atypical melanocytic hyperplasia uh, or melanoma, I send them to uh, a surgeon with whom I've worked for a long time because I don't want them to amputate unless we know that this is invasive and extends beyond the DIP. Uh, signs of concern, as I said, Hutchinson sign, loss of the nail plate, increasing width. The color makes you concerned. Uh, when the border is not well defined by dermoscopy, that's a bad sign. Wide bands are more concerning. When you see people who have bands in multiple nails, they're reassuring, although you can actually have multiple melanomas in the, or type 2 melanomas in different nails. We use dermoscopy on these because they help us determine whether there's disorder in the pigment. Uh, the concern is that many of these can be amelanotic. Our, our mantra is that if we see a new onset pigmented band in the adult Caucasian, uh, we strongly encourage uh, biopsy. In people of color, we usually will photograph and follow unless there is something that makes us concerned. The other thing is the patient has an in input. One last entity that uh, can fool us uh, is people who pick on their nails. Uh, they chew on them, they bite on them, they can do all kinds of things. What we look for is bizarre findings in the nail unit. Now, this could this be a melanoma? Yeah, it could. But you can see all this erosion of the proximal nail fold, all the scale, 
this person has been working on their nail avidly. And when you talk to them, usually they talk, they'll say, well, yeah, I've been trimming this. Sometimes they'll show you the metal instruments they're using. Uh, this is a, can be a form of OCD. Uh, uh, it, it can be quite extensive. Okay, so uh, for the pathologist and for people who are doing nail unit uh, uh, biopsies, uh, orientation of the specimen is critical. We do several things with the specimen. Uh, we will take the specimen and we will put it on this template. This is a, a filter paper template, uh, and we will orient the specimen on this template uh, in the area of, of the nail, where it was from the nail. We will ink the surface uh, or one edge or one side green. Uh, usually we'll ink the proximal tip with another color. And then the tissue on this template goes in the cassette and the cassette then goes in the form one. Uh, so orientation on our side is very important. The other thing is orientation with your text. So, you have to work with your uh, histotechs to get them to orient this correctly. So this is a dot phrase and I have an epic that basically says, call Thomas, uh, call the dermatopath resident to orient the specimen. Uh, and then I tell them how the specimen was oriented. Uh, usually the base is attached to the template. The surface is ink green. Sometimes on one of those sagittal sections on a longitudinal biopsy, We'll ink a radial or an ulnar surface, and we'll ink the proximal tip so that we know exactly what we're doing. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One is it makes it easier for you. The other is that uh, it makes it easier for me to tell if the specimen has been oriented correctly. So my nightmare uh, is uh, when I send uh, a, a longitudinal biopsy and it sections transversely in this direction rather than longitudinally or sagittally. Uh, and what happens, if you cannot tell the difference, then you end up having to destroy that part of the nail. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Okay, thanks guys.